Good morning. How's everybody? Everybody's good? That's good. That's good. Everybody got power? Currently? That's good. Yeah, we lost power for a few hours yesterday morning. Gave me a chance to meet my neighbors again at the 7-Eleven at 6.30 or 7, getting a coffee. And, uh, I'd like to be able, I'd like to be in the uh, compression, what is it called, the, the uh, alternative system? Generator business. I think it's probably gonna be real good for a while. All right, well, welcome to those here at, uh, in uh, our sanctuary and to those who are worshiping today via Facebook Live and or Zoom. And uh, it is good that you are here on the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, what's going on? It's pretty much clear. Do we, do we have more need for uh, items for Lutheran uh, world relief? Yeah. Towels? Okay. If, if pardon me? Towels and soap. So we're getting close to having everything we need for Lutheran World Relief, but if you can pick up some towels and soap, that would be terrific, and you'll kind of see that whole right up here inside of the bulletin today. So hopefully we can get everything uh, ready to go very shortly. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Patty Oates and Joanne Hagen for all they're doing, and Bob Oates, and it's such an important ministry that's been part of our tradition here at St. John for many, many years. And it's, uh, uh, it's a source of great pride and inspiration you know, for our involvement in the worldwide Lutheran Church. So please uh, join in if you haven't. And if you already have, thank you. That is a good thing. Uh, God's Garden continues on for a little while. It'll be in the evenings, I think, on Wednesday at 5.30. Uh, for the time being, the morning session's over because school will be starting before you know it, so uh, here at the church. Um, the other thing I just wanted to bring to your attention, this place has lots of different uh, air conditioning units, and they're starting to age out or they need repair or whatever, and um, the, uh, we, we, uh, we're putting in a new air conditioner in the uh, gym here in a week or two, I think, and the money's been raised for that. It's like 26,000 bucks or so. But anyway, uh, these things need to be done. And, and now, I don't know if you hear, uh, there's a squeaky sound in the narthex. If it's still running, there's something going on there. But uh, we're going to have to uh, do a repair on the air conditioning unit that serves all of the narthex. And I think the estimate was 10 grand or something like that. Just uh, FYI, you know, uh, and uh, we just want to keep you apprised of what's going on and want to keep the place comfortable. Uh, but now we're about the business of trying to figure that out. So keep that uh, in your prayers. That would be good. Um, I think that's all I have for now. So if we could prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And uh, we'll have it. Yep.
Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, and the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to you for our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn to us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and you are nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and you are loved into abundant life. Amen. Be seated. O oh God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside, and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
The first reading today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that, I, that I'm teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is, whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The word of the Lord. Lord, you may dwell in your tabernacle. Lord, you may dwell in your tabernacle. Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth, from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon their neighbor. <laughs> Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They have sworn upon their health and do not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second reading today comes from the book of James, chapter 1. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand me, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, 
they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able for a reading of the gospel. Today's gospel is according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes uh, who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless it has been washed. There are also many other traditions that they observe, uh, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes, they ask Jesus, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but rather eat with unclean hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it's written. The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold on to your human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and he said to them, listen, listen to me, all of you, and please understand there is nothing outside of a person that is, by going in can defile. But the things that come out, those are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All of these evil things come from within, and they can defile a person. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. You've got to change your evil ways, baby, before I stop loving you. You've got to change. Now, here's good news. Three pieces right up front. One, I'm not singing anymore. Stopped. Two, Carlos Santana's not God, but he's pretty cool. And three, that God does love us. No matter who we are, no matter what we are, no matter where we are, God's love is not reserved. It's unreserved. It just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing to the whole world with the hope that each person, each child of God can embrace that love, be filled with that love, and then share it with the world. And that's pretty good news. It's always been that way. If we go back a few thousand years to Palestine, the scene of this uh, story today, a few things to remember again. First of all, Palestine is uh, a property of the Roman Empire. It's controlled by the Roman Empire. It is seen by Rome simply as a trade route between Egypt and, and Rome. And it's an important piece of property that has to be maintained. It's essential that trade can flow back and forth through this portion of land. And, and to do this, to make sure that that trade route is safe and sound, they employ what is called the Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome, which really isn't all that peaceful. It's a type of an oppression. 
It's guided by fear. It makes sure that the people stay in their places, pay their taxes to Rome, and don't cause any kinds of disturbances that could slow up fair trade, or so it's called. Now, in Palestine, what Jesus and his disciples are dealing with, beyond the Pax Romana, which is serious stuff, is that 90% of the people in this part of the world are poor. They have 10% of the wealth in Palestine. 10% of the people control 90% of the wealth. I think you can already see a kind of a challenge unfolding for Jesus and his disciples. And to make it even more interesting or more challenging or more sad, the Roman Empire embraces a cultural uh, perspective or um, oh, just an atmospheric of honor and shame. So if you are wealthy, you are celebrated in the, in the world. You, you, you have honor. If you are poor, you live in a state of shame. And you're reminded of that regularly. And of course, state of shame with uh, coupled with the fact that you probably don't have enough to eat. Your loved ones are dying sooner than you would wish. It tamps your spirit down. It makes it hard to even imagine that life could be any different. And certainly, it helps keep the peace of Rome. Now, what fuels this to a great extent is corruption, there's no question, and greed. Uh, greed, Jesus uses the word avarice in this. I always thought it was a spice, but it's not, it's greed. And um, it's a big, big player. It's a big, big player because the people that help control 10% of the wealth, they are proud of the fact that they control the wealth, don't do a whole lot for it, and laugh at those who have to work so hard to just simply get by. It's kind of a miserable kind of a thing when you think about it. Well, this Jesus guy is a type of a threat to the Pax Romana, because you see what he's doing, his disciples and he are, they're breathing life into people. They're telling people for the first time that they are children of God, that they are loved, that they have the potential to do so much more, that there is a hope that can be found in the great shalom. They are, being, they are just being revived and revitalized to some sort of degree. And things are starting to happen. And of course, Jesus preaches against the rich. He invites them to share some of this wealth and to curb the corruption. And this is stirring up a little bit of dust. Not good for Pax Romana. And so today, what we see are some Pharisees and some scribes traveling all the way up to Gennesaret, which is about 100 miles north of uh, Jerusalem, on the uh, west side of the Sea of Galilee. They travel all that way. It probably takes four or five days to cover 100 miles back in the day, but they mean business. So they, they travel all that distance, and uh, they uh, are there to observe Jesus and ultimately to try to poke a hole in his ministry. I mean, they're there out of fear. They are definitely a part of that syndicate that 10%, they are part of that. They have a vested interest that the Pax Romana stays pure and simple, and they try to find a way to disturb his ministry by pointing out the fact that they don't observe all of the laws. That's the problem. Now, if we travel back to our day, 2021, and we look at our milieu, it's useful to, I don't know, compare and contrast and imagine now as disciples 2,000 years later, how do we identify with those 2,000 years ago? What are the challenges that we face? Well, in the United States, 70% of the wealth 
is controlled by 10% of the people. Not 90, 70, and the rest is controlled by the rest. It's still a big number. Um, is there greed in our society? Have we witnessed greed? Have we re witnessed corruption? You know, yeah, it's part of the milieu. It's part of what makes those numbers happen, whether it's in government or business or the nonprofit sector or even in the church. There's greed and there's corruption. It exists. Wherever there are people, there are these challenges that are, we all have to face. And it's hard. It's hard for many. It's hard in a way for any Christian who's trying to live out their faith in the midst of a milieu that really honors wealth, just the way they did back in the day, and um, really is passionate about rugged individualism. How can I get ahead? Now, some of that's fine, but there's some challenges to it as well as we think about Shalom. There's also, I don't know, I, I've, it's, it's a weird thing, but I'm gonna call it benign neglect. Um, but the God of efficiency, it's a tricky thing. It's any, anybody that's been part of an attempt to become more efficient has within their heart struggled with the downside of it. People are going to lose their jobs. There's an upside, too. There's progress. There's advancement. No question. But it does create an ethical dilemma that at least should be considered. And sadly, a lot of times, it's not. It's part of our milieu. It creates that 70%, and I tell you the truth, that number will keep going up. It'll keep, you know, it'll keep going up. I don't know if it'll ever get to 90, but it'll keep going up. And within that, there is a challenge to extend shalom to all people. Do we pay attention as a, as a culture to the impact the things that we do will have on all people? A question, an important one to consider. Well, anyway, we're going back to Jesus and he's dealing with the, with the scribes and the Pharisees and he says to them, he says, you know, you guys, you're hypocrites. I mean, what you've been doing, and the prophets before me have always talked about this, is you guys, you know, you come, you worship God at the temple, you say your prayers, you do your thing, and then you fall right back into this mess. You fall right back into the mess, and you make the temple complicit. It's, it's, it's a real, real problem. And it's something that needs to change, you're all show, you don't go. It gives direction, all kinds of, you know, sins and things like that, that, that can corrupt this person. We've read them all. And at various stages of our life, we may have focused on one or two or three. But the big one, for Jesus, for Jesus, the big banger, and again, personal piety is very important, not even a question, that's for each of us to work out, but the big banger, the one that if you can get a hold of it, it opens the door to shalom, and that is greed. If that can be addressed, if that can be addressed, things are gonna change. But until it is addressed, it may be very difficult. Now, I call that good news. It represents a lot of hard work, a lot of introspection, but it points to true north. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And it was a good thing for the people to hear back then, and it's a good thing for us to hear today. Now, 
I do want to say that most of this preaching that Jesus is doing is directed to the rich. Some of it to the poor, but most of it is trying to loosen that grip so that all people might enjoy a little bit more of life. Now today, hey, here we are at the church, and we struggle with our milieu. We struggle with this issue of independence and competition and the need to be first. And we compare and contrast that to the elements of shalom and God's peace and mercy and justice. And uh, it's quite a bit to sort out. It's not all that easy because we do not live in a society that says, before you do anything, please think of the impact it will have on all people. We, we just don't do that, and that doesn't mean we, it doesn't mean it's a, um, an opportunity to just to do nothing. That's not where we're going here, but it's to be aware of where these things may be and to th think creatively about how do we make what we call progress in a way that resembles our understanding of God's love for humanity. It's something to think about. We've been given a roadmap. Jesus gives it to us. We know what the issues are. We've been given our faith. And we've been given the opportunity to be God's hands and feet. The big issue is probably still greed. But in the end, this dilemma, which can result in one big headache, this dilemma represents for us uh, an opportunity to go on a new adventure, a new opportunity to look at life differently, to look at how we respond to things differently, to recognize that Jesus is always with us, to know that God's love is flowing to us, to recognize we have the encouragement from the Lord himself to take important next steps. And so what this gives us, if nothing else, is an opportunity to discern what really is going on. Is this of God? Is it not? How do I respond? How do I articulate my belief? And we're always going to have some evil ways. We're always going to make some mistakes. But we've been given the gift of the eternal now. We've been given today. We've been given the opportunity to truly make a difference in this world. Amen.
Please stand. This is a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Whether we meet in assembly or worship from our homes, we join together in prayer for the world. Today, in response to each bid, you are invited to offer your own prayers silently or aloud and to conclude each petition with an echo of today's psalm, Abide With Us. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ around the world. A time for prayer. Hear our prayers, O God, abide with us. We pray for the pastor and staff of our congregation. A time for prayer. Hear our prayers, O God, abide with us. We pray for the well-being of the created earth. A time for prayer. Hear our prayers, O God, abide with us we pray for a halt to wildfires hear our prayers O god abide with us we pray for peace throughout the world hear our prayers O god abide with us we pray for nations experiencing adversity of any kind. Hear our prayers, O God. Abide with us. We pray for our elected leaders. Hear our prayers, O God. Abide with us. We pray for an end to prejudices. Hear our prayers, O God. We pray for schools and Sunday schools, the students and teachers. Hear our prayers, O God. We pray for those facing the coronavirus. Hear our prayers, O God. We pray for orphans, widows, and widowers. Hear our prayers, O God. We pray for all who are sick or suffering. Hear our prayers, O God. We pray for those we name here before you. Deline, Shirley, Mary, Betty, Marlou, Jim, Chris, Diana, Ward, Eva, Dick, Audrey, Ellen, Dolores, Carol, Prudence, Selma, Eunice, Tammy, Lillian, Jody, Joan, and Howard. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Finally, we pray for ourselves. Hear our prayers, O God. 
We give thanks for all the faithful departed, and we pray that at the end we join them in your presence forever. Hear our prayers, O God. O God, in your mercy, receive these prayers. For the sake of Jesus Christ, Master, Teacher, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Peace, love, and understanding. All right. Peace be with you. 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 Peace to all, Shirley. Peace, Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Hi, how y'all doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing much better, thank you. Good. Is that word? Please stand. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self, and you called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. On the last night of Jesus' life, he gathered his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem to prepare them for a world without his physical presence and to set the stage for a ministry that would follow. He saw in each of his disciples remarkable gifts, remarkable strengths, and as he told them always, I know as you move forward, you will do even greater things. Than I. And then he took the bread. He broke it. And he gave it to each of his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Given for you. Once the supper was over, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is my blood shed for you and for all people throughout the world for the forgiveness of sin. Do this and remember me. We know with the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are strengthened to be his hands and feet for a world that desperately needs it. And so together, let us pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who are trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Please stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in his peace. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers and half-truths so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with the tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless us with enough hope to believe that through Christ, we can make a difference in this world. Amen.